Whatchamacallit. Kind of eerie. Yeah, I've been high and low. I've been sober. I've been fighting. Yep. Searching for my love in all the wrong places. Huh? Word up on the streets <laughs> is I got a bad reputation. Say what? Yeah, I may have been a high man. But that was true. Yeah. yeah. Love it. I'm liking that. Huh? Yeah. You're Great not a choice. I gotta, I gotta admit, you're not a bad hype man. I'm you can, not you can bad. be that guy that's yes. like walking around the stage. Yes. Just like I could do it. Yeah, yeah, you could totally do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of these days, one of these days. Welcome back to you, Hawks. Episode 229. 229, believe and it or not. We've got a great one tonight. Oh, this man, we gonna are going to have some fun. I don't want to let the cat out of the bag too much, but we are going to be focusing on mergers and acquisitions. Yes, today, absolutely. Which um, a lot of people, I'm sure, are very curious to know more about. Oh, yeah, yeah. Very Especially popular in topic. Climate. Yep. yep. I think there's more A's than M's these days, but we'll get in more of that. Yes, we will. Let me turn this off so it doesn't bleed in there. Um, a couple weekly updates. Um, we've been floating the idea out there recently about the geoholic store ah yes yes we're calling that not that's it's the merch store yeah the yeah, yeah merch yeah. store i think we're really close yeah to yeah, releasing yeah, that yeah, right we're, we're finalizing some you know Final, kent's got to make I'm sure we have on the, the spot here have the right colors it, it's <laughs> it's been my baby and i've been dropping the ball but you're very particular about like like the certain yeah. type of cotton and like the fits i well, mean it's very you know, you're a very very difficult everybody customer everybody wants to look good in that, their gear. That is true. Sure. That is true. Uh, we got a couple really cool events coming up. We've got Intergeo in right about three weeks, right? Two weeks? Three weeks? Uh, we, uh, the wife and I leave in two weeks. Two weeks. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I am yeah. slowly approaching no longer give a crap mode. And that might be the source of some of your uh, anxiety. Uh, yeah. In just the been, back of your mind, you're thinking about that. Big well, it's, coming. you know, it's been, it's been a busy week, been, you know, a short week, lots of crazy stuff going on at the office. Plus I got, you know, a big trip coming up big that, trip. man, it's, it's all coming to coming to a head here so yep yep so stay tuned check out our social media for announcements yeah. on that and we, we are ma- we are going to make a point to do more posts on social media mm-hmm. and some you know like what the kitties do with the selfies and the little videos and get our uh, get our tiki talkies out there more for the for that's our, why for we have fans. a social media person yeah that's right that's right yes. well we, we have to still record the content ideal. i know i know yeah, but we're gonna ideal. do a better job this year and then we have uh trimble dimensions after that and those are the final two events of the year yeah, that we'll yeah. be uh and a busy making year. an appearance at yeah, yeah that's right it's been great real quick announcement because we're coming down to the final quarter of the year also be on the lookout for more information about uh being a friend of the program oh Oh, for yeah. 2025. The upcoming. We need to start to renew those pretty quickly. We do. People we do. are starting to talk budgets for next year. So mm-hmm. we got to start to float that idea out there. It's a great opportunity for companies to promote their, their services, their products, whatever. I think while... you were just finalizing the ROI for being a friend of the program of the Geoholics. I was. Yeah. I You're right. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Yes, exactly. And then the other thing that I want to mention is it was nice to come into a clean studio. Oh, did you finally hire a cleaning person? No. Well, me i'm the cleaning person okay course, good good for you what was nice normally after a show the next day i come in <laughs> so it's, it's like, like a frat house <laughs> it's like a frat house yes and it was nice last week was just like that last show we did we did two last week and that oh last yeah, thing we do yeah. Was just like a quick and dirty <laughs> promotion week. of uh, go geomatics expo coming up and uh but no it was great so it was good to walk into a clean yeah studio. yeah i must admit it it did, yeah. it did feel nice when we walked in here a couple catch-ups what's new with you did you oh. have a good long weekend uh it was not long enough mm. Uh, but it was it was good and relaxing, you know, just hung out with the family, hung mm-hmm. out with some friends, didn't yep. do anything crazy. It was good. What about you? Great long weekend. Oh, you yeah. Know. You were up in the you know, up in, we up were, in Pine, right? We yeah, did. Yeah. We were up in Pine for the weekend. Um, mm-hmm. It was interesting. You and I were talking before the show that, like, you've been so stressed out the last week and things just aren't, you know, aligning and everything. Carl was talking about having a stressful day and stressful week. And you're like the complete opposite. It's the opposite. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's <laughs> easy I'm, I'm, breezy. I mean, this is, you know how it is. I mean, it's like yeah, this. Yeah. You know, and right now it's like things are aligning, you know, personally and professionally. And it's a good feeling when that happens. You know, of course, 
in an instant, it can change, you know, yeah. and go anything for granted. Got to remain <laughs> humble. And going to Europe in two weeks also helps. Yes, indeed it does. But yes, we were up in Pine for the weekend. Um, actually, our weekend started on Friday night. Uh, Megan and I went to a great show. The Struts and Barnes Courtney Ooh. played at the Marquee. Uh, was uh, Willa McKenna up there with us with you? They were up there. They were already up in Pine. Yeah, they oh, met cool. us up there. Nice. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, Roger Klein, the Peacemakers, played up there this weekend and got to see him and ate some of the best pizza in Arizona, as far as I'm concerned, up there at Old County Inn. Free plug. Don't get used to it. Mm-hmm. And, of course, the amazing weather. Most importantly, NFL season kicking off. Uh, I, I believe that as we, we are speak. as we speak. Very excited about this. A long time coming. Indeed, indeed. All right, let's move along. Uh, NLC Prep Song of the Week. If you are preparing to take your uh, survey exam, FSPS, what have you, be sure to check out nlcprep.com. Anybody I've talked to that has used NLC prep to prep for their exams has passed on the first try. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Very good. What do you got, buddy? Uh, all right. Uh, newer artist, second time on the show. That was a song called Falling in Reverse by Jelly Roll. Well, hold on a second. What's that? Falling in Reverse is the band. Oh, it's Jelly falling Roll in reverse with Jelly Roll to be on the show. On the, on that oh, song. that's the artist. Yes, falling in reverse is the artist. Oh, thanks for clarifying. Yes, yeah. Okay. okay. Name of the song. You can start. The there. name of the song is "All My Life." Oh, I got to check our copywriter here. Uh, <laughs> falling in reverse is an American rock band formed in 2008 by lead vocalist Ronnie Radke. When Carl was talking about that earlier, after his mm-hmm. departure from Escape the Fate, the band is known for blending various music styles, including post-hardcore, metalcore pop punk and electric elements over the years falling in reverse has evolved musically experimenting with rap metal and electronic influences thus Mm. jelly roll the band's lyrics often focus on themes of personal struggles self-reflection and mental health yeah great great band love that song glad to have him on the playlist and uh i should mention the playlist spotify always the geoholics playlist now is up to 14 hours of music every song from every episode in chronological order is on that playlist. It's gotta it, be it one is, of the. I mean, I don't think we can promote this playlist enough. It's incredible. If you get nothing not, from it, it's just. It is a naturally eclectic. It's a mix of music. Yeah, yeah. In fourteen hours, if you're flying to Australia, it's perfect. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. We are in the Diamondback Land Surveying Studio this evening. As we are about Diamondback Land Surveying, they provide complete surveying, mapping, and construction staking solutions <laughs> for residential, commercial, and public works projects. DBLS is a firm made up of highly skilled professional land surveyors with over. 200 years of experience in the public land survey system and construction surveying. Their survey teams take great pride in being professionals in all aspects of their work and emphasize on-time service that maintains an excellent reputation in the construction and development communities by consistently providing top-notch services to our clients. Dude, that was like the best read You ever. did really good. Yes. Yeah. To find out more, go to diamondbacklandsurveying.com. Yeah, we don't talk about TK enough about how great a, and great a talk, guy and great this great DBLS. When is. When you really talk do. to TK, make sure you mention him for the Geoholic sent you. Oh, absolutely. All right. Next up, the Geomax Weekly Service Pro Tip. To find out more about Geomax, go to geomax-positioning.com. Love this quote. I know. It goes right along with this year's, a lot of, lot of the theme of this year. Yep. All right. So here we go. If we are not failing... We're not trying big enough things. Mm. <clears throat> that was Jesse that. Cole, owner of the S- Savannah Bananas. Yep. 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 Love that quote. Um, any any further commentary on that, Sean? You know, uh, my you wife. You feel like you're failing enough. Could you fail more? I, I can always fail more. And it's part of, I got, you know, little little self-reflection here. Part of the anxiety and issues from this week mm-hmm. was still letting that fear and shame of failure come in yep. when it really shouldn't be there. And I got to push it back out. Yeah. Yeah. Can only worry about what you can control. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And most things you can't. And even if it doesn't work out, that means I'll at least tried something and we're going to, you know, and all the things, you know, this, what? all those sayings come into yeah. play, you know, this, this stepping stone or this failure is tomorrow's stepping stone and all those other things. Yep. But that's very timely. For me. Yeah. And nobody's going to die. Right. Yeah. Nobody's exactly. gonna, it's going to be all right. All right. Next up, the GeoSearch Career Corner this week. They have a client that's looking for a sales exec- executive Ooh. in Denver, Colorado. Really? Not a bad place to live, actually. Uh, their client is searching for candidates with a minimum of three years of sales experience, preferably in the land survey, construction or heavy equipment industry. Uh, yeah, this position requires a working knowledge of the local construction market with a proven track record demonstrating the ability to develop re- relationships with customers and promote sales, rentals, and service. 
In this position, you will be responsible for prospecting and identifying opportunities and closing deals with small, medium, and large contractors. You will be selling TopCon and I haven't heard of this brand, to be honest with you. Is it Futura? Futura? Not sure. I butchered it. I apologize. Robotic total stations, construction lasers, GPS, and 2D, 3D machine control equipment and supplies, among many other products. This position will require you to be a driven, self-motivated, and goal-oriented individual. Mm, Nicely done. To find out more, simply go to geosearch.com. And as always, happy happy mapping. mapping. Love those guys. Geosearch. They're they're the best. I always forget about them sometimes, you know? Indeed. Okay, we're here. We got it. Time to bring in the uh, the experts on the, the subject matters. So yeah, let's get this thing going. We've got Byram Hess with us, Carl Oberg, and Duffy Haggerty. And what we're going to do real quick is let them do brief self-introductions. Uh, Carl, I'm going to let you go first. Let's just go with name, kind of who you're with, what you do. And then our icebreaker is going to be, what would your walkout song be? That's easy. So I'm going to start with a walkout song. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Love it. So since we're on the falling in reverse mm. uh, kick right now, I yep. would have to say Watch the World Burn yep. would be my song. Oh, ah, okay. I, I, so yeah. I do know this band. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 you know, yeah. Ronnie Radke actually raps just as fast as Eminem does <laughs> in uh, Monster. So it's pretty awesome. Really? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Super talented. So my name is Carl Oberg. I'm actually a regional director for Ardura Group. Our Dura Group um, is about a seven-year-old firm, and we are, as of today, about 1,750 people. Wow. Oof. I actually, and about 85-plus offices, I am the regional director for, it's it's in the Southwest. We call ourselves a mountain region, but we're not really that mountainous. So mm-hmm. Arizona, Nevada, Utah, Colorado, and New Mexico. So. Nice. I think that's mountainous. I, I give you mountainous, mountainous there. Yeah. Yeah. Good mix. Uh, Byron, why don't you go next? I'll start with my uh, walk-up song. That would be uh, "Blind" by Corn. Ah, oh, nice, yeah, good one. That song always gets good me one. going. <laughs> yep, that's awesome. Uh, I currently work for Bowman. I used to work for Hess Roundtree. We were acquired by Bowman uh, December of 2023. Ah, um, paint's still dry. A little too dry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm currently overall the integration. Everything from accounting, IT, HR, all mm. that for our Hess Roundtree business unit. And then I also manage all of our solar clients, um, which is all survey work. Nice. 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 All right, Duffy, last but not least. So Duffy Haggerty with David Evans and Associates, and I am the business unit leader for survey and geomatics. And I guess my experience that I'm bringing to the table, just to clarify a little bit, I've not been involved uh, directly in a lot of our acquisitions, but I haven't been involved in the integration part of uh, ancillary. So I wanted to start with that clarification up front. And my walkout song would be Johnny Cash, Burning Ring of Fire. Oh. <laughs> I knew it was going to be Johnny Cash. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Those were all three really good answers. Yeah, I feel like we should just add them to the playlist because. Yeah, I think I think we should. <laughs> All right, let's jump into this here a little bit. Um, oh, of course, those icebreakers were sponsored by Trimble Geospatial. Oh, yeah, we got to uh, mention them as many times as we can before yeah. Dimensions in, before, in, in be November. Sure, <laughs> be sure to visit geospatial.trimble.com for all your survey needs. Oh, yeah. Fair enough. All right, let's go. And of course, as I mentioned, our, our, our topic of conversation this evening is mergers and acquisitions because a number of the folks on the show have been involved with either a merger or an acquisition yes uh at some point actually sure. all, all of us have all of us have. yes yes and uh there's a ton of this happening right now you know it's like every day i get on linkedin and i see you know sam purchase a new company or so and so person colliers purchases yeah you know our every, is now our <laughs> yeah exactly so there's a lot of moving parts right now so there's a lot to talk about there's a lot that needs to be considered um and uh, we need to take full advantage of this opportunity to talk to these folks that have, have been through these these things. Mm-hmm. So um, let's just kind of get real general right out of the gate. You know, when it comes to like a strategy that needs to be uh, you know considered when when going into a merger and acquisition. Um, so, Carl, I'm going to let you go first just because you're sitting right in front of me and I live my life vicariously through you on Facebook. Um, talk about talk about like a, a general strategy that needs to be thought about, you know, going into one of these situations. Well, you know, one of the things that I've seen and I've been a part of uh, multiple mergers and acquisitions is when you start to think about wanting to sell first, you, you want to look at all different aspects internal cell, external cell. If you're doing an external cell, how do you want to go about it? 
But no matter what you do, any sell you do, even internally, you need to make sure your your net value, your EBITDA is a certain point. Your mm-hmm. liabilities are way lower than your assets because mm-hmm. we've seen that. We've seen where assets, like if something happened to the company, their liabilities are higher than their assets and mm-hmm. that usually doesn't work. So for anybody wanting to sell their firm, um, then those are things I would say, start looking at that. Start so you're saying sure you your should have an actual like plan uh, some sort of idea on how much you make a year and what your assets are and what your liabilities might be and oh yeah you know and and you know what your backlog is um your longevity have you had claims um Mm -hmm. your employee longevity so i mean those are things that that like we look at Mm -hmm. with firms yep yep and let's one thing we should probably mention is um Prior to Ardura, Ritak Powell was your firm, and you were major, majority owner of Ritak Powell yes. at the so, time when you were acquired. Yeah, so yeah. I, I acquired Ritak Powell in 2004, Okay, um, and I was employee number five, and I was actually employee number seven, but two of the employees, Ritak and Powell, were leaving. Ah, right? ah got it. So it was easy for me because it wasn't so expensive, sure. but I there's a lot too when you acquire or you open up your own firm. Yeah. There's a lot more to it than people realize. So, yeah. Yeah. We're going to get into that more. So Byron, in your situation, um, like how did, like, how did your firm know it was, was time to go through, um, you know, an acquisition? Uh, probably the biggest thing was the age of the owner. He was getting closer to that retirement age. So he kind of knew I need to start figuring my exit plan out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the biggest things I'd put is start earlier. It's all right. No problem. It's only water. Oops, a daisy. If it was vodka, it'd be different. But it's only water. <laughs> I'd be licking it off the table. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you want to start earlier than you would expect because it it can take multiple years. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the biggest things that a lot of times people probably start too late. Yep. Um, the firm that I work at, my dad previously owned, and he he was always planning to sell it internally. Sure. But he ended up getting cancer and had to sell it. Like, mm. didn't have that time. But then you're selling under distress. Sure. Um, the former owner who just sold to Bowman, he thought about went kind of uh, thought he was going to go internally. But then after kind of evaluating it, mm. um, making sure everyone's on board because there are a lot of things that go into it, and there's different risk depending on if you're doing it internally mm-hmm. or externally and how the deal's set up. Gotcha. Um, but it does take a good amount of time to go through. We talked to, I think, three different firms mm-hmm. oh, wow. before we actually were acquired. And yep. two of them, we actually went pretty far down the path, like where we talked for over six months. Mm-hmm. So, Interesting. So it can take a while to kind of work through everything. Yeah. Kind of come to the place. Yeah. So is there like a, is there like a uh, I don't know, a, a, a civil consulting marketplace where you put your firm up there for sale type thing like how how do these other firms know that uh that, that, that you guys were in that position uh for us I'm, i don't know to be honest i think some people just because like you said there's a lot of merger and ac- acquisitions yeah. going on so i think you get a lot of cold calls so we got a lot of just cold calls i uh, gotcha one of the first ones was our former owner actually uh, had a relative that was at a firm that Mm-hmm. was looking to acquire okay the second one i think was just a cold call mm-hmm. like a merger and acquisition firm basically reached out and said hey are you thinking about retiring mm-hmm. and then that bill <laughs> fell Gosh, dang it man <laughs> that was awesome <laughs> i love it <laughs> <laughs> that, that fell through and the merger and acquisition guy that was working with that firm actually hooked us up with okay. bowman because we'd already kind of uh, been through a bunch okay. of the due diligence we're kind of primed and ready to kind of yeah yeah and so. you said something early on um about well, we'll we'll talk about surveyors specifically but typically horrible business people and most of the time do not have an exit strategy so they're put in a position of um oh, i don't know weakness a lot of times i mm. suppose as a result of that well i don't i don't think it's just surveyors <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah like, there's like it's 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 engineers as well. I mean, yeah. one of the things that we all talk about in surveying and engineering and construction management and inspections, 
not a lot of us went to school to study mm-hmm. business yep. or even English for crying out loud. Or yeah. economics or yeah. anything. Like, I didn't have an economics class. <laughs> no, not at all. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When, when along point. your career did you learn what EBITDA was? <laughs> About a year ago. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> No, um, no, I think I, everything with me was trial by error. Yeah. So it was like, I just had to jump into it and and learn it. Yeah. Yeah. Seems to work out. Okay though. So I love the, I love the due diligence aspect and we can, we can ask Duffy this to, to start, but when you get into looking at a firm and say, you're, you know, you're the whale swallowing the minnow, so to speak, what are the things, you know, uh, Carl said a couple things, but what are some of the due diligence things that you really focus on? First, when you look to see if a firm is attractive or somebody you want to bring on the team. So in most of my experience with integrations, like seven or eight years old, so it's a little bit stale and it's coming from the side of actually post integration and Mm -hmm. actually integrating it with the team. And one of the things I can say from that perspective is that as the, you know, team integrates as part of the group, the culture is so important. Right. And how well does the group that's there integrate with what your group's doing? If you have two separate entities, they're working independent of one another. That merge doesn't work as well. Right. And so it's so critical, you know, from my perspective in the due diligence stage that you're, you know, vetting out that uh, what that cultural differences look like and what that merge could look like. And is that yeah. like, uh, you know, personnel capabilities and lines of service, or is it just general office people disposition and how, you know, what's more important? Is it general attitude or, or purely, you know, lines of business? Well, we all know that attitude's important. So that's, you know, it's important with any type of integration that if you've got a, you know, a positive attitude, it makes it easier. But I think with more than anything, it's the processes. So, and how they go about doing things. And if you're set in your ways and you've been doing it for years and you bring in a new process and it's completely different, that's where your confliction can start, Mm. you know? Yeah. So you mean you can't just go on that company's website, look at their... um... Uh, their vision statement and say, oh, yeah, they're, they're, surely yeah, that sounds fit. like a good vision yeah, to me. Let's, let's bring them in. <laughs> it kind of matches ours. This, is, this ought to be perfect. Hey, that's what they did in the 2000s, <laughs> right. 2024. Uh, how about you guys? You guys want to talk about due diligence a little bit? Well, first of all, I think the name Duffy Haggerty is an awesome sports name. Right? Yeah. I keep looking at his name. I'm all, man. And I know. A quarterback, number one, Duffy Haggerty. Was, <laughs> number like, number one like, in your awesome. hearts. Right? Yeah. I think it's more like a cowboy bull rider or something, right? But I have to totally agree with what Duffy said. I mean, culture is a big monster part of it. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that I appreciate about Ardura uh, and why I went to them was because the CEO owned his own small company mm. and over time it built up. Well, his idea was if we're going to acquire, let's acquire small to medium sized firms so we can maintain a culture quick and nimble. Yeah. We want to have that family style. We want to, you know, keep these people happy. Let's get rid of the bureaucratic or the bureaucracy. I was about to, I was about to curse. I, I, was, <laughs> I remember you told me not to curse. No, it's okay. Oh, fucking cool. Yeah. yeah so yeah, yeah. Um, we're after 6 p.m. You're, you're good to go. Shoot. But no, it, um, so culture is a huge part of it because a lot of us started our firms because we didn't want to work for the big firms. We didn't want to be number 85086 or mm-hmm. whatever. And, you know, we wanted our clients to realize if there's a problem, you can call me. Mm. You don't have to call somebody that may not answer that goes to somebody and stuff. So culture is huge. And I know Bowman has a great culture, by the way. So mm-hmm. um, uh, we've seen it. It's great. So, um, yeah, um, thank you, quarterback Duffy, for throwing me that lock. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. Take it home. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, so, Byron, you mentioned like you were talking to or your company was talking to other firms as well. So obviously you went with Bowman because you felt like they were the best fit, right? So uh, that was part of it. It was well, there's money. There's a lot there's of things money, involved. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. What's yeah, the yeah. best fit? Uh, but going back to the due diligence, a lot of what Carl said earlier on when you were asking about what do you start doing? Because mm-hmm. um, a lot of information is going to be required. And most people, especially if you're a smaller company, and as we 
just talked about a lot of engineers, surveyors, they're not trained to be business people. Mm -hmm. um, you kind of learn as you're going. So you might not have a lot of the information like, oh, well, what are NSRs? Are these numbers put together? Or do mm -hmm. I have a list of my top 20 clients over the last um, <laughs> five years? And so there's a lot of that that you basically are going to have to produce a lot of um, of the financial information and and or put all that together basically, which yeah. does take a lot of time. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. So maybe a better way to approach this is if, if you were a smaller firm and you're you're looking to, you know, you're looking for an exit strategy, what do you guys think would be like the top five things that you want to make sure you put together before you kind of go to market or or put yourself out there? I mean, you need to understand your your 12 month EBITDA. You need to know what your assets and liabilities are. What are some of the what other big ones that you see firms coming short on bookkeeping mm -hmm. bookkeeping yeah, is big. in general yeah. um that's that's the biggest one we've seen some of our acquisitions fail at was you know just maintaining a good book so there was one firm that we looked at buying and we got into their they had dell tech vision and it was very clear that they'd never had training with it ah and that's, the that's good problem we had was if we were to buy that firm or to acquire it the amount of effort we would have gone into in trying to understand how to clean up contracts or finalize contracts was was going to be a nightmare. So I always mm -hmm. recommend when someone's about to sell or thinking about selling, get your books in order, hire somebody who knows what they're doing because it's worth it. And then also make sure your computers, your vehicles, your equipment are updated because there's other times where I've looked at acquiring firms where they had uh, survey equipment that was outdated. Sure. Um, and we all know, you know, in order to get the, what, S1s and all that kind of stuff that it's, it, you know, it's not a, not cheap. Um, so that was going to be an uh, investment we would have made. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would think, you know, companies that have the most up-to-date equipment and stuff like that, I mean, that just says something right out of the gate about how they do business, you know. And the other one is always make sure that you've taken care of your clients. And when I say that, uh, we don't like to look at firms that have claims or had a lot of claims. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a big one. Um, you know, make sure your clients are happy because if you have a bad reputation, mm -hmm. nobody wants to buy you. I had somebody in my office go, you know what? You, we keep buying these firms that are busy. Why are we not buying firms that are not busy so we can use our people and be busy? I'm like, <laughs> there's a reason so, so you're telling us to buy a shitty firm yeah, right? <laughs> so that you don't have to work hard and then we're just going to lose money there. And then we're yeah. going to lose money by those employees probably leaving because they don't want to be busy. You yeah. Know? Why don't you just wait for them to leave on their own, not, not by the firm? Yeah. Yeah. Well, but That's you mentioned, other... uh, you, you mentioned that uh, about equipment and that kind of is a good segue on valuation. Mm -hmm. And yep. this is one of the things that I've seen. I'm sure everyone here has had that experience of, the firm, the guy that has, you know, doesn't have an exit strategy has been doing this for 30 years. And he thinks that his oh, yeah. company is worth X a billion dollars. Yeah. Right? Yep. <laughs> right. exactly. And then you look at it is he doesn't even have any books, so he can't prove it. He, all his equipment's outdated and it's just something that someone told him 15 years ago is what he should do. What do you, uh, what do you got? Maybe Byron, you can, especially cause you're a, a CFO according to your website. <laughs> what? Uh, no, not <laughs> But how do you approach valuation? What's something realistic that guys can get some value out of? There, it's going to be your financials. It's going to be your book of clients, contracts you have, stuff like that. Your back so you're log. saying you actually have to have written contracts well, in place. Or if you, like us, we had on-call contracts. Those yeah. are going to bring a lot of value because we do a lot of schoolwork. Mm -hmm. um, so if we have like a five-year contract or something like that, that's mm -hmm. going to be it. But it's basically most of its financials. A lot of your equipment, they're not going to put any value on. Like... There's value there, but it's not, you're not really taking that into consideration. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. basically, it's, you're going to go through and look and see like, what's your NSR for you know, the last three years type stuff. And then that's what's going to drive your value. You're going to have to inform our listeners what NSR is. Uh, it's net service revenue. I'm on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, that's it's, a, that's it's, enough. It's, it's basically <laughs> your revenue divided by... Your revenue factor. Now I'm getting confused in my head. But, <laughs> you basically okay. what Carl yeah. said is you need to hire somebody yeah. that knows what that is so and they can put it on paper. <laughs> NS, NSR is take take out your uh, direct um, project expenses. So yeah. take your consultants uh, okay. out and take yeah. your, So what's actually your revenue? And then the other things where I was getting confused is, is revenue factor. It's taking that NSR number divided by your labor. 
which yeah. basically shows how kind of profitable you actually are. Got it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So those are what they're going to be looking at is like, what are you actually, what's your actual revenue? And then how profitable is mm -hmm. that by comparing that to your labor? Hmm. Yeah. And I know some like these old school surveyors, you know, they think their records are so valuable, right? Yeah. Because they've, uh, they've got 20 years of records in a particular oh, no, county it's like or 80 whatever, years or whatever, whatever it yeah. is. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's always a sticking point. And then even some contracts, you know, because a lot of these contracts, if you get acquired, you know, there's an out clause in there that how much value is really in some of those contracts, you know? Well, so that, it's, a, it's a tricky situation to do an evaluation for sure. Well, and that's some of the stuff during due diligence towards the end. Is yeah. You, you have to identify all the contracts that you do have to get transferred over. Yeah. Cause so yeah. you have to start understanding all that, mm -hmm. which usually you're not paying attention when you sign some stinking yeah. contract. Yeah. For your, yeah, yeah, yeah. You mean all the other, all the language in that yeah. 30 page document <laughs> that you flip to the bottom and, oh, yeah, yeah. Sign. sounds good. <laughs> How about you, Duff? You got anything to add to that portion of the conversation? Valuation? Yeah, I could double down on the equipment. So if you're like an integrated survey firm like we are, for example, and you bring somebody on that's running a different set of equipment, there's not much value there at all. You know, I mean, and we mm -hmm. all know the resale on older equipment is not much. And so, you know, it, I see a lot of people that I talk to and think that, you know, oh, we got all this equipment and we've got all this, you know, that side of it. And there's not much there. I, I think that's a, a big piece. The other thing that I was thinking is, is that I think you had mentioned it before is the, the liabilities come with it, right? Like you could have years of public records, right? But when you're getting acquired, it, all those liabilities come with you too, you know? Yeah. And so there's, there's upsides and downsides with all that, you know? So <laughs> it, well, what's the value on that? I don't know. Well, and adding on there. to that, that's something that owners, when they're looking to sell, need to think about is the cost of a uh, trail, a trail, yeah, yeah, trail policy, basically. And those aren't cheap. No. Mm. <laughs> so usually they're going to acquire a three year yeah. trail. So, um, what, no, what is that? Okay. So, so what it is is I was about to like uh, explain this a little bit. So, mm -hmm. there's two types of purchases there's an asset purchase and there's a stock purchase. So, when you're selling, you want to do a stock mm -hmm. sell not an asset sell. Mm. When you sell the assets, that means all the liabilities are still, uh, as far as safety or, you know, project wise, mm -hmm. those liabilities stay on the, the original owner and you have to have, have tail coverage. Mm -hmm. um, I, I said trail. I forgot. Yeah, it's tail. Tail coverage. And that's not, that's not cheap. Um, but sometimes you can just do like a three year or five year or something. So when you're buying a firm, you want to do an asset purchase. Mm -hmm. So. All right, Geoholics, got to introduce a new friend of the program this year, Aerotech Mapping. Aerotech Mapping has been supplying high-quality geospatial solutions, services, and support for the AEC industry since 2002. They've completed projects across the U.S. and abroad using the latest technology and resources combined with a highly educated and experienced staff. They specialize in large-scale, design-level photogrammetry for a variety of sectors within the AEC industry, including aviation, transportation, energy, commercial development, mining, public works, and wastewater, just to name a few. Their mapping is produced under the direct supervision of an ASPRS certified photogrammetrist, and they've invested in the latest equipment and technology to ensure that they meet their clients' challenging demands. At Aerotech Mapping, they take great pride in the work they do, all created by an amazing team of professionals. To find out more, visit atmlv.com. Interesting. Interesting. Another good segue to private equity. That's something that's been talked about. I mean, I've heard the term private equity more in the last five years than I ever have in my life, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I can't, I'm, I'm not going to say I fully understand how this works, but I'm hopeful that one of you guys can shed some light on that. So I did another podcast and it was strictly about internal and external sales. And one of them was with the uh, external. Mm -hmm. You have um, really three options. You can go with, you sell to another firm, mm -hmm. um, venture capitalists, um, I don't if you understand that. It's like somebody will just say, hey, I'll give you a bunch of money and, 
you know, we promise you'll get bigger. We'll give you all. We're, we're going to let you handle everything. We're <laughs> yeah. not going to get in your way. And, and, and then, and then 12 months later, they it's... <laughs> take over. Uh, and then there's private equity and, um, and then, and there's public, I guess so there's like four, but private equity is a bunch of investors. And the way that I talk about private equity investors is that I got to be careful how I say this. Okay. So <laughs> let's just say the stock market people are like kindergartners and the private equity folks are seniors in high school. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yes. Their education for economics is superior. Yeah. And so when a private equity firm comes in and looks at uh, purchasing any of you, you look at it, you let them look at it because they know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, the reason why they know what they're doing is because they only invite certain people to invest. They're, they're not the you's and me's guys. These are the, Waltons and the mm -hmm. Trammell Crows and the, you know, mm -hmm. Black and, Rocks. And yes. And uh, they uh, do a recapitalization every four or five years so that whoever's investing gets their money back and then they can do it again. So these private equity folks, they don't buy to lose, they buy to win. And that's one of the things I would explain. So that's so all these private equity folks are like, hey, these firms are making 25, 30% profit. That's better than the market. So mm -hmm. let's do this. And as you buy, you get more EBITDA and you get more X on EBITDA. So if you're a smaller firm, it's your net value. We'll just call it net book value is your EBITDA is three times that is what you could sell for. But as you get bigger and bigger and bigger, it becomes 10 times, mm. 15, 15 times, 20 times. You know what I'm saying? So that's why private equity has gotten really big into the mm. in, in this industry. And, and I've also read, some, seen some stats too of the, that they're, and it's been recent in the last, what, five to 10 years, really in the last five years, it's been a big push into the AEC market mm -hmm. and mainly because they see what the potential investment is, you know, federal government and all the, where all the money is and that it just, it's strictly supply and demand. There is a huge supply of, of uh, there's a huge demand for AEC and there's a whole bunch bunch of trillions of dollars there and they look at all the AEC companies and all the professionals out there and there is this much supply out there and like well clearly mm -hmm. there's a lot of there's a lot of runway with all these firms let's go like you're saying let's go put our money there because our rate of return is going to be better than anywhere in, in any other market right now and for the foreseeable future you know 27 28 that's still where the where the projections go mm -hmm. I think it's going to be that way for a long time um, well, wow. I mean, we're, and it, it's, it's the salaries that surveyors and engineers make have never been that fantastic. You know, we're, we're pretty much held by what the government salary would be. And now because the demand is so high mm -hmm. and the supply is so low, we're actually starting to see some good salaries. I mean, I mean, I'm seeing land surveyors that are making six figures easy in the, in the first five years of having their PLS. We have talked about this many, and it ties right back into a common theme of the, de, the, the supply is so low and the demand is going to still be high. I mean, right now an RLS is commands just as high a salary as, as a PE. Engine. Yes. And that's, do. and that's been recent in the last few years where that's shifted. And I, it's we awesome. keep talking about it and it's great. It's and no one, no, everyone I tell that to is like, Oh, I didn't know that. And I but, tell my nephew, Hey, Kid, <laughs> nobody's teaching it, right? Yeah. yeah, nobody's teaching survey right now. I, that that is very yeah. very correct. I'm going to add on to that. I think that's part of the reason you are getting so much M and A right now. But I was encouraging our form since we were a small company. I think it's going to be hard for small companies long term to have <laughs> RLSs on. Yeah, because really, well, there's just not a supply. Mm -hmm. So if you're a small company. You don't have the same resources to hold that person on. So at some point, mm -hmm. like we were at risk, if we were to lose our RLS, it's not like I could replace them tomorrow. It could take you months. Yeah. I, we might be out of business and sued for everything by that time because. Yeah. So, yeah because Duffy and Carl are hiring them all. So, so it's a huge <laughs> risk. Damn it, Duffy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's pushing towards yeah. M&A because right, right now it's hard if you're a small company and you're depending yeah. on an RLS because they can literally walk out the door and get a job anywhere and then you're stuck. Yeah. 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 And, and it, it doesn't matter even if you're small, large. I mean, it's just people are following the money. And I, I always try to, I, there's a dichotomy there because I want people to be loyal, but I, I understand they need, you know, it's nice to make some money. 
the other thing I learned when owning my company was I could be as loyal to my employees as like beyond belief, but my employees weren't as loyal back, mm. yeah. even though they would say they were. Yep. So I would throw money at them to keep them and stuff thinking, Oh, they're loyal. They're loyal. Yep. But then some other firm ABC would say, you know, Hey, I'll give you an extra 20% with mm-hmm. a signing bonus of 25 grand. Yeah. All of a sudden the loyalty to me was gone, you know? Sure. But it's okay. Cause they want, they need, you know, they want to make money. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Yeah. All good points. Stuffy, you got something to add there? Well, obviously DA is employee owned, so I don't have any direct experience with private equity, but I do have the experience of competing with private equity and, you know, it's, it's hard to compete when you're especially going after somebody or trying to recruit somebody and you're trying to do it on the basis of, well, this is what my clients will give me. And it seems like when they're offered something from somebody else that's getting backed by another source, it's like, the sky's the limit, you know, and we can't compete for that because we're looking at different factors, you know? Yeah. Good point. Is there any concern on longevity there? I mean, I know some, you know, like a, a nice, you know, fun employee owned company like DEA, you think, okay, this is, this is where I'm going to end my career. And like you were saying, it was and maybe not more in the private equity, but maybe the venture guys, but you know, is there a risk of, okay, they're going to let us go for a few years and then they're going to come in and shake it up. And then I need to, I mean, is there, do you guys see that risk with, with bigger companies coming in and making purchases? You know, yeah, you see that, but you see that no matter what. Mm-hmm. So fair. like I, I turned my company from, I said like five people to about 85 and we went through all kinds of different changes. I mean, there's growing pains no matter what. Sure. If you're 1500, mm-hmm. if you're 12, you know, when you grow, you, it, it's hard because I remember going from QuickBooks to Dell Tech Vision. That was like a, <laughs> a splitting the Red Sea. Yeah. It was like impossible. Right. <laughs> but, you know, we had to do it. Uh, Ritok Powell did. I don't want anybody to ever be fearful of that, but there is a point when you're at a, to me, because I've worked at H&TB, I worked at Parsons, I even worked at Kemley Horn. So I worked for some of the big firms and there are some pluses and minuses from the big to the small. First of all, I hated being a number. I'm a loud mouth. So I like to do my own thing. And now, you know, owning RPA and, and I'm sure Rom feels this too, is like you your or Byron, um, that you're, you're, you're the boss and all of a sudden you have a boss. Mm. That's pretty difficult. I'm yeah. used to going, Hey, can you come into my office? Let's have a conversation. <laughs> and now somebody goes, Hey, I need you to come into my office. I'm like, fuck you. I'm out. You know? <laughs> so it is a little different culture, and yeah. it, but there's always change. Sure. No matter what. Mm. So, yeah. Well, we you know going into it, there's going to be change. Right. And we kind of danced around a little bit. You can talk about fear, talk about excitement. Talk about the emotions in general that go along with, you know, being a part of a transaction like this. You know, in your case, Carl, you know, you had 85 employees that you had to think about. uh, And I'm sure Byram in your case as well. Uh, One of the things, it's going to be a roller coaster. I'm sure you might have had this where there's going to be a lot of ups and downs um, during like the due diligence and the negotiations. At Mm -hmm. times you're like, hey, it's going well. Then at times you're like, is this going to fall through? (laughs) Um, so it is a very up and down kind of journey. Sure. Both uh, during due diligence and then after during integration is also going to be probably, you should expect it to be rocky. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Oh, I agree. That, I mean, there was many times I was like calling the CEO of Ardora saying, you know what? I'm done. I'm out. You asked me for one more thing. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> one more. Okay. I get you. I can get okay. That I'll right. get you that. <laughs> <laughs> right, I get, yeah, it's okay. It's okay. But, you but you know, it, it is, it's, it's hard. If you ever do decide to um, go into an acquisition or a merger, just be prepared. Like what mm-hmm. Byram's saying, um, the month prior to closing is hard. Like one of the hardest months ever. And the six months after closing is hard, yeah. <laughs> but not as hard as that first month prior to closing. Oh, uh, okay. Because well. you're getting all your information and you're digging and also you're finding things you're like, oh, damn. Is this a deal breaker or not? Like, did, mm. I, did I really forget to pay those guys? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, 
I thought I thought we settled that claim. Yeah. Like I thought that was done. Like <laughs> you start looking at your assets and you're like, oh, where's that truck? <laughs> yeah. Did we sell that truck? <laughs> I have no idea. Like you, know, like you really find out weird things. Like you find things are missing or whatever. Sure. But it is tough. It is tough. Yeah, yeah. But then you mentioned like the next six months. Talk a little bit about that. And I know that's where Duffy really comes in of that integration. And, you know, we talk about cultural and we, we say that word a lot, but mm -hmm. uh, I'm interested in what you guys think about what are those, what's your experience been in those first six months? What's been really, really good things and what's been really, really rough? You Duffy, Duffy, first, Duffy, I'll let you go. So I know you're itching. Okay. I, I'll kick this one off. So I think uh, I can say that on two different cases, there's, you know, kind of the small, small company when they come over, I have experienced that there's a tendency to want to do kind of smaller projects and making it really difficult to integrate being a bigger company. You know, we all know that the, the short choppy projects are hard to integrate with the flow and, you know, kind of dropping some of those old habits are, you know, they're difficult to do. Um, I, I can say that there's also like little uh, ceremonial things that uh, come with, you know, some of the, the companies where they like ring a bell when they win a project and stuff, which there's nothing wrong with that. But you're never going to see that happen in, in all of the offices. Right. It's never it's not going to be something that just like picks up and takes off. Right. And it's like some of those old habits are kind of they're hard to drop and you kind of walk into the offices even after, you know, five or six years and you're still seeing remnants of the old culture of what it was. And hmm. it's like, it's only unique to there. Right. You know, so is that, is that a problem? Do you, you don't want to be the guy that squashes their enthusiasm and well, rips and their bill off the, off the door, but you also want them to too, integrate right? with the I team, mean, right? Exactly. So that's, I mean, I think that's the challenging part. It's like, at what pace are you taking away and forcing the change Aaron, and what things do you just let go? So you got to kind of pick and choose, you know? But there's a lot of things that, you know, they that are hung on to. Right. In that yeah. for that transition time. What's been your experience, Byram? You're in, like I said, you're in uh, month nine or something like that. So <laughs> you're, you're fresh. I am. And we literally just went into there. We were in Dell Tech uh, Azera and we just went into their Envision. Yeah. And last week was our first we can vision and we're doing our billing right now. So it's Oof. been a rough week. <laughs> I'm glad that you've been able to join us. Cause <laughs> um, am I getting a paycheck this week? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I better not say anything. <laughs> Certain hiccups do come along the way. Sure. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, across the board there, as he said, you're trying to get like, you have the employees that are anxious. Um, for us, we went from a smaller firm to now a public company that's a lot larger, um, which has a lot of just different dynamics in itself mm -hmm. and trying to get people to adjust and understand, like mm -hmm. having to work to quarterly numbers. Sure. Where it's not like, hey, I'm not worried if I have a slow month. And now it's like, no. Yeah. Your quarters actually matter too. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. But just across the board, there's just a lot of items that you're trying to figure out how to kind of merge the two together. Um, and then for us, like there is a lot of times where you don't have direction or it's who do I reach out to, to try to figure this out. So a lot of people will still come to me and I'm like, I'm, I'm in the same boat you're in right yeah. now. Trying to figure this out. <laughs> yeah. Puts you in a tough spot for sure. So what about, about, about on that same topic, you know, what you've got leadership from both companies involved, you know, how do you determine what the org chart is going to look oh, like, yeah. you know, when an acquisition like that takes place? No, we're looking at you, Carl. Because oh, yeah. <laughs> mine, mine was tough. I will say, lots um, of dotted lines mm -hmm. and uh, and well, you know, first of all, I I know exactly what Byram's going through. Um, the the uh, you know at at some point you have to figure out where your your one year anniversary and whatever you had your you know whip or contracts and stuff, mm. um, you would get it at that one year, whatever was left over, right? So they, they call it a peg, by the way. <laughs> and when they say peg, I'm like, oh, does that, what kind of peg are you talking about? <laughs> I feel like I'm getting the wrong kind of peg. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, you, you know, going through that. The other thing is, um, 
before I, I answer your question, because I wanted to add a little bit more. Our, my biggest challenge was the back office. Uh, let's just be honest. Uh, engineering, surveying, inspect, inspection, we all do the same thing. We're right. all the same. <laughs> We're all the same. We can all do it. We all love it. But when somebody from a financial side tells me how to do something or an HR side or a marketing side, I'm like, hmm, that's funny. It doesn't say Ardura Marketing Group, and it doesn't say Ardura Financials. So our biggest challenges as engineers and surveyors and inspectors is that you're being told how to run a business by people. And mm. you're like, oh, well, wait a second. No, you all support me. Mm. You support me, period. Yeah. So those have been some of my challenges, and I don't know if you're going through that. And and it's not necessarily a – it is a bad thing. I'm not going to fucking blow smoke up anybody's ass. It is a bad thing. <laughs> and that's something that people are working on. In our company, we're working on that too. We're like, okay, listen, people. Yeah. What did you – I know you smiled about that, Duffy. What do you, what do you have to comment there? Oh, I just can relate to the angst, like, you know, seeing people try to integrate with like your accounting system, for example, and dealing with the billings and dealing with, you know, now I got this accountant I got to answer to. And the accountant's telling me it's done this way. And it's like, well, I haven't done it that way for years, you know. And, and my client likes it this way. That. way. Yeah. yeah. It, you, you asked me about the org chart, too. Yeah. And, and I, I veered off. I squirrel for it. Squirrel. The org chart was the was a huge challenge. And the mm. reason why the org chart was a challenge was because um, our folks were being told by somebody in Florida how to set up an organization. Mm. And when I say our folks, it was another individual that is no longer with our company. And when they set up that org chart, I said, this isn't going to work. Because you understand the insides of, and the, the, the information and insides of different individuals you know, this person cannot work with that person. Mm. And now you've put that person under that person, <laughs> you know? So, uh, org chart is very, very but, challenging. But you can only have five direct reports. So if that guy's got six, he's got to go over there. Yeah, That's yeah. just how it is. Right. <laughs> but, but I think, you know, one of the things we try to do at Ardora is we try not to really have an org chart. And yeah. that's and that's failing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the reason I that's say awesome. that, I might lose my job. <laughs> I'll, I'll work with you guys. Yeah, cool. No, but it's it's it, it's the younger people. They want to know what the ladder is. Yes, sir. absolutely. So, yeah. And what's cool is our CEO and CFO. Like, they're all like, okay, maybe we do need to have an art chart. But when you're acquiring, I mean, we've acquired like four or thirty firms now. Wow. So when you try to acquire and you try to you're like you're constantly doing an org chart. <laughs> yeah, right. All the time. So it's, and, it's challenging. And I've made that mistake me personally. It's ah, we don't need it. We don't need titles. We don't need any of this stuff. Just, you know, you work for you. We all support each other and then you realize that was just me thinking this is what people, especially the kids want and that's yeah. not at all what they want they want structure they want to see where i can go from here to here they want to know who their boss is and who his boss is and it's all got to be all dialed in and it is harder than i ever thought to put that together yeah. it on our end it was interesting we had and i'm sure every company does it different uh choirs the way bowman does it right now is they kind of leave you on an island where they, it's like, okay, you still have your unit as we're integrating most of the structure still there, which creates some issues mm. as you get kind of far down the process. Cause they actually split engineering and surveying are two very, yeah. like two different businesses. But it's when, a novel idea. When we're still trying to be together, but then we know they're splitting. Then you have some people that are like, well, you're my boss right now, but you're really not. Cause which that can create some issues. Plus it was just funny. I remember in their thing, it would say like, because they and they have in their system, you could see like what the org chart is. But I would look over here and it would say, "This is oh, it says I'm the branch manager over here, but over here I'm under corporate account, and over here." <laughs> so I'm like, I don't even know. Over here it calls me this, over there it calls. Me. I was like, what? Yeah. yeah, technically I answer to the junior controller, but I also oversee this department. Yeah, I actually run this whole business unit right. too, but I also need to. 
my boss is technically someone I never met in person. No. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just looking forward to being in the basement looking for my red stapler. Right. <laughs> <laughs> just, 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 well, I, I got it, and that kind of brings up a question that I really want to ask, and I want to get you guys, guys, honest, honest feedback. You all been through this. Have you real? Have you ever caught yourself being a straight up hypocrite where you said? I am not going to do this. We're going to do X. And then six months later, you're doing Y. <laughs> like, is that, can, is it really possible to keep, I mean, I hate to say it, but have you been in that position? Uh, daily. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Duffy? I know, I know you talk a lot and make a lot uh, of commitments. Uh, uh, well, and I can relate for just hiring people on you, you deal with it, right? You try to paint this picture, right, of what it looks like and how it's going to be. And, you know, yeah, you may get a pretty high percentage on it, but, you know, there's, you know, nothing's perfect, right? And uh, a lot of it's still in the eye of the beholder, right? <laughs> and who's looking through their lens, right? Can, so, can you I, uh, personally I'm attest to that? <laughs> <laughs> I am going to say no comment. <laughs> no comment on that one. <laughs> great <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> so funny um so my experience uh as far as an acquisition goes i was working for a larger firm in chicago we were acquiring a hundred person firm out here in phoenix got approached in chicago um hey do you want to move out to phoenix be part of the acquisition inject the corporate culture all that fun stuff and i'm like oh my god this sounds amazing i've always wanted to live in arizona my kids are young this is perfect get out here this other firm the, the employees they did not want to be acquired at all. And it was like everything was pushed back, pushed back, pushed back. And I'm like, this is a freaking nightmare. What have I gotten myself into? <laughs> but I think that's probably something that's very common when these things happen. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I luckily I went in with expectations that <laughs> it was going to be rough, <laughs> which helped. But I'm constantly talking to our employees, trying to make their expectations reasonable to what you're going. That, hey, integration is going to be held no matter what you do. Yeah. Like you, we just have to get through these, there's stuff's going to happen. Sure. And, and that's a good, um, and that's a good segue too, of like, how do you communicate to your employees what to expect? You know, what's the best message that you can give to them and what are maybe some warnings thing, you know, what, what do you, what do you tell your staff? I, that actually starts and it can differ between who, who's the person selling it. Cause some of that needs to start during the due diligence. Obviously your key employees, Right. Just to make sure you're retaining certain ones, usually there's going to be certain incentives, mm -hmm. um, and you're going to have to identify those yeah. probably, probably before you ever even start thinking about selling. Yep. So you want to do those. Our owner, in my opinion, let the employees know too early. Ah, that's a good point. Which can create a lot of issues because since that one didn't go through, then your people, because then I was worried, like, are we going to lose certain people? Because it creates anxiety and people, yeah. yep. they want to have the choice of their own destiny. And they're kind of like... So I had a lot of times like kind of walk people back like, hey, we're and, and give a lot of information to let people know like this is still going or right now we're working on these because people would be like, hey, what's going on? What's going on? <laughs> it's like, so even when you tell and who you tell when you're kind of looking to sell yeah, matters. Um, like I said, I think you, you want to be transparent, but you also need to wait to a certain point because if you go too early then, and if it falls through, that can create a lot of issues down the road. Yeah. Um, and then once we were acquired, a lot of it is just say, trying to let people understand like, Hey, there are going to be rough periods. Like you're just, that's kind of expected. We're all in this together. That's a big thing. Mm, nice. Yeah. That, that it's, Hey, it's not you. Like the difference between like, cause we had some employees that thought about, like I had one employee that was about to take another job and I was able to kind of talk them out and be like, Hey, you're kind of doing the same thing. At least here we're going together. Mm. <laughs> yeah. There you're going on your own. You never know how it's going to be. On kind of see side. this through kind of thing. Yeah. Like at least, at least we're all together and we have your back. We know your value when you're going somewhere else. Like everyone promises it makes it sound so great, but yeah, once you get there, who knows? So yeah. What yeah. about you, Carl? So I was actually surprised. So we, we were going through the due diligence. We didn't say a <laughs> word to anybody because it could have <laughs> fell apart. And, you know, exactly what um, Byron said is that, you know, if you tell people too early, then it could backfire on you. Um, if you tell them late, it's okay. I mean, because if they're partners, though, they need to be mm -hmm. understanding. 
I was super surprised how many of my employees were actually excited about this opportunity. Really? I thought I was going to lose like 50% of my employees Hmm. because, you know, there was an opportunity for them to grow within my company, but now they can, they're seeing, they can actually grow within a little bit bigger company. But what my problem was, and when I say mine, RPA, Red Talk Powell, is we're really an Arizona firm. And when things were tight in Arizona, we were tight, you know, Mm -hmm. now if things are tight in Arizona, my folks can work, you know, we can Mm -hmm. share work everywhere, you know, across the nation. And a lot of my employees really liked that. And they, because it gave them a sense of security, like Mm -hmm. they they weren't going to possibly lose their job if we didn't win a couple big projects. Right. So the other thing is, is that you definitely, the, the keepers, you know, the ones that have been with you, the ones that are actually really loyal, (laughs) Um, our company was really good about saying, Hey, we're going to give you this payout, but we really, really want you to identify who your top people are. And we expect you to give some of your money to them. Mm. Mm. Interesting. And we tell that to other firms that we acquire and it's actually, it's been very successful Mm. out of the 30 firms we've purchased. Only two of the owners have gone one retired and the other one, none of us liked. So, um, we kind of pushed them out <laughs> in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, and none of us have to be there. Right. And that's the way we feel with our employees and our employees see that they're like, Oh wait, Carl doesn't have to be here. Mm-hmm. You know, he can be in his garage playing with his cars or whatever, but they, they see me being there because I want to be there and it makes them want to be there too. Mm. So, yeah, well, I, I think in that case, like you and the rest of the leadership team at RPA, you guys had you know had to paint the picture correctly, and you had to like stand behind it as a cohesive unit so that the employees all bought in, right? Because if there was any you know crack in the armor or whatever at the, at the highest level, then people are going to start questioning everything, you know. Well, and the other thing is, is it's like any story. It starts out as a blue car went by in the morning to mm-hmm. it was a red truck that raced by in the afternoon, you know. Mm-hmm. So, and what is there is always three sides to a story, one, the other, and yep. then the truth. As long as you're clear with your employees, mm-hmm. you know, this is what's going on and just precise. It, you're, you're, it, and the clarity is where it needs to be, you know, for it to be successful. Yeah. What do you got to say about that, Duffy? Come on, quarterback. Well, Throw me a pass. I can, <laughs> I can relate from our experience bringing over the two survey companies that we integrated. The leadership was very important. And I think uh, being on the kind of post-acquisition side of it, it got kind of a pretty much an excited team, you know, that was ready to integrate and go to work. And I think one of the things that you'd mentioned, too, is the – the layers of PLSs and experience that was not there for them, now all of a sudden they had was reassuring and securing. You know, I mean, they could get QC or work share from other places and and that's something that they didn't have before. You know, so there was a blanket of security with that. This portion of the program is sponsored by Altair Central. Altair Central is the authorized premier Trimble dealer for survey, mapping, GIS, forensics, and marine equipment in Texas, Oklahoma, and Arizona, and MGIS in New Mexico. Our good friend Scott Spears, um, he's been traveling a lot. <laughs> it looks like it. Yeah, he's got some uh, he's got some territory to cover these days. Uh, they have eight offices and provide sales, rentals, repairs, and support for the full line of Trimble products, GPS, GNSS receivers, robotic total stations, scanners, Seiko accessories, mobile mapping system, used equipment, and field supplies, including our good friends at Juniper, Juniper receivers and Absolutely. tablets, laser tech, true pulse range finders, and micro drone UAVs. They also offer field supplies and can del- deliver them right to your job site. I think we both know that. We've used them in the past. We have. And, and they have helped us on a job site. Oh, every single time. Finally, they offer used Trimble survey and mapping instruments such as GPS systems, robotic tool stations, scanners, and more, all available on their website at allterracentral.com. Most importantly, all of this is backed by a service department with one of the fastest turnarounds in the nation. Love the folks at Altera Central. Absolutely. Visit alterracentral.com. Yeah, and are, are there are there any keys to that? Because what you just said, Duffy, like kind of hits home. Like having a team that's 
ready and excited in that transition? Like, what do you think the keys are for that? I mean, like you said, it's obviously clarity and being up front with them and not maybe not being too early, but definitely not too late. Well, yeah. I think Ken and Carl both point out too, it's part of selling that. Just like if you're hiring someone, you always tell the story of your company. It's letting your employees know here are the upsides. Like we had the same thing. We, in a smaller firm and the way our older engineers worked is they would do a lot of the old school red line. So like our drafters were <laughs> literally just copying those and it, they're really using AutoCAD, not Civil 3D. So they were excited. So we were able to tell them like, hey, you will have these opportunities now to learn and try new things or to like some of our younger engineers. Hey, you will have the opportunity to work on different types of projects mm, now. Yeah. Um. So kind of pointing out some of the, the sales job is saying, hey, here's, here's stuff's going to change, but then here's some of the positives that will be going yeah. forward. So, and what you said there is, is probably accurate. Like you do have to sell it to yeah. your company. Like that's part of your job, right? Yeah. yeah. That's being a good leader, right? Yeah. Yeah. As long as you're not lying to them. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah right. I'm telling yeah. you, that's, Good point. that's, that's what will, will hurt in the end. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That'll come back to bite you. What it's like, what would you say are like, I don't know, some of the top three risks that come to mind if you're considering doing something like this, so you can maybe proactively address before you take that step. A lot of that depends on what kind of deal you're doing. Mm-hmm. So if I'm doing like an internal deal, usually people aren't going to be able to pay for it all up front. Yep. So you're going to have a lot of risk because you're probably going to have to carry a loan type mm. thing. So that's going to have a lot different risk than if I'm, and same with like if it's an asset deal or a stock purchase deal, those have a lot different types of risk involved with them and tax consequences too. Mm. So it kind of depends on what kind of deal you have and even what's the structure of the deal. Cause a lot of them might have performance. Sure. Um, basis that you have to hit basic yeah some so, metrics there yeah metrics yeah for sure well capital gains right i mean that's a lot to manage right well and depending on if it's an asset deal or capital or a stock deal that makes a big difference yeah because <laughs> yeah, some some companies will want to go and buy like i did uh because i purchased six firms you know before i was i sold yeah and you know some of them was like hey i'll give you a third down a third stock and I'll pay you the other third in three years. You know, that's how some people mm-hmm. do it. But uh, when you do, I, by the way, I mirror everything you said on that stuff. That was, <laughs> you, the risk you said, it was exactly what I would have thought too. Uh, there are a lot, there are some risks, definitely some risks, but there's also some benefits. Yeah. You know, people don't make it by not being risky. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't try, you won't know if you'll ever be successful. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people will always ask me like, I can't believe the risks you've taken. I'm like, you know what? I've, I've failed. I've not been perfect, but the few that have worked in in the end, the median was way better. Right. Right. So, but also, uh, with an internal cell with what Byron was saying, by rum was saying, I can't say that quick. That's for sure. um, <laughs> is that uh, I've seen people where they'll do an internal sell and then the people that are running it don't run it right. Yeah. And the person that was relying on that money didn't have any money. Mm. Let me explain something. <clears throat> Nobody will ever run your company the way you run your company, period. I don't care if it's your son, your daughter, your best mm. friend, your whatever. Nobody will ever run your firm the way you ran your firm. Hmm. And that's something you got to got to get over. So an internal sell to me is way too risky. Yeah. Way too risky. Sorry for you people that want to <laughs> try to buy your, your person's firm, but it's too risky. Yeah. Well, and like, again, in your case, you know, you were a majority owner of uh, RPA. There was a lot of letting go, right? Letting go of control, of letting go just letting go of the things that you've done a certain way for X amount of years. It's got to be tough. Yes, it was. Sometimes it still is. Sure. But one of the things that I got to let go was actually my freedom. I got to create a freedom Mm. because when I owned the company for 20 plus years, I never could go on a vacation. Really. I always had to be within Wi-Fi distance because I did. I was always worried. Right. Yep. But letting go, like I went on a European trip 
and sailed the Greek islands and stuff with family. And it was the first time I've done that in so long that I, it helped teach me to sure. start letting things go. I saw, I still struggle with it. Yeah. I ain't gonna lie, but yeah. I'm getting better at letting go mm-hmm. because I got to trust the system. I just yeah. got to trust it. So, yeah, it's a, like a emotional paradigm shift, you know, what is, I, I'm going to add something on that, which is important for owners that are looking to sell. If you are thinking about internal, something you need to think about the people that you're thinking to sell, are they going to be able to come up with some type of equity enough that makes sense? Cause you, you need to make sure you have enough equity put down that they have something to lose. Yeah. Mm. Um, and a lot of people don't think about that. They're thinking like, Hey, but does that person have a house they can borrow from mm. equity loan on or like they have to have some way to get that money. And a lot of them don't. And owners don't always think about that, that, Hey, how are they going to get their down payment basically? So that's something you need to start thinking about. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. There's a lot to digest there. Duffy, you got something to add? I, when I think about it, I think the risk is in the people because like anything with business, they need to perform and it comes down to the people still need to perform to make that return on investment from that. And so I think it's, it's gotta be, that's gotta be one of the biggest risks there are is will the people continue to perform? You know, I don't, I don't know how you, you know, how do you cushion that or anything, but um, I, I just think that that's, that's gotta be an important factor. Right. Well, like you said, you're, 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 you're doing an internal sale and you're not only doing that transaction, but you're also transacting the responsibility of performing like, like Duffy is saying, like, that's where you have to make sure, like, do you realize what I go through and you're going to have to take that. And if you don't, it's not going to work. Right. Mm. Um, By the way, internal cells aren't bad. Uh, So don't, don't get me wrong. I'm just saying the risk is more with the internal cell than Mm -hmm. the external cell. Right. Sure. So, I mean, there, if, if someone's already been putting away a ton of money and they're, able to live comfortably and they want to do an internal sell to their employees mm-hmm. that's great and that's awesome because they're trying to help somebody build something right but understand the risks that you have going into it versus other options that are out there with more backing and more you know stability right yeah i'm gonna add a little bit to which is kind of putting both these together that's something on the seller side you need to think about before you're going to sell too is if you plan to exit in a year or two or three do you have someone that can run your unit, especially if you're out of state. Cause I know that became an issue mm-hmm. um, with one of the companies we discussed with is our former owner wanted to leave. He only wanted to commit to like a, a year full time and then mm-hmm. go to part time. Well, they didn't see like, well, who's going to run this office. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, I'm not going to do that. So, <laughs> yeah. so that's something you always have to think of. Is there someone there? Cause companies will want to know that they, if they don't have someone that's going to, Hey, step in, they're going to want to see, is there leadership that can run this when that person stepped away. Cause a lot of people that are selling, they want to be sure. able to back off. So, yeah, something Duffy said made me think of this, you know, a lot of companies, you know, especially reputable ones will say that their, their people are their biggest assets, right? Is that the same? Does that hold true during an acquisition? Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, isn't 100%. that half the point of well, acquisitions is, you know, you, you can't grow organically in the market cause they're not making surveyors and engineers anymore. So you just have to, buy somebody that already has them right yeah yeah i mean that's what you're buying right the assets aren't worth shit according to you guys the trucks are dog you know (laughs) i don't want any of that i'm buying those people and yeah but you can't put like a dollar sign on like you're worth five bucks i'm worth a thousand you know i i I, I don't know i think carl would have (laughs) would say otherwise i'm like i think he has to actually put dollar signs on like yeah you know our industry, we're a relationship-based industry. So to be honest, it is mostly about the people because sure. the reason I get work from certain clients is because I've developed that relationship. So yeah. a lot of times it is your people, the relationships they've built. Mm-hmm. And, but you're not it. selling the idea of Hess or anything else. You're selling Joe in the corner that's going to crank out your drawings on time. Like that's what you're selling. Craig, right? but you've developed, you're also selling because they know, hey, like if I've, I'm a project manager and I've worked with this company for 10 years and they know, mm-hmm. Hey, we're reliable. They like, we were talking about even trust. Like you need to be honest with your employees. They, you, I've, you've developed that trust mm. in our industry. A lot of times, like when you're getting your project managers, they have those relationships and that's where you're getting that work from is driven from the relationships. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the risks that I'm going to pick up off what you just said was, um, 
whenever we buy a firm or acquire a firm, the risk is that the owner will leave and then people will follow. Yep. So there was, uh, you know, there was, um, there was some, some federal law that passed about, uh, you know, non-compete, non-compete mm-hmm. and stuff. Well, it came back. So at least that protects some people, but you know, you, you're buying the firm because of the people. So mm-hmm. when the people leave, that kind of hurts. And yeah. You're stuck with all this work that nobody can do because all your people left. That's a big risk. And those are things that we think about when we're even talking to a firm to acquire, not mm-hmm. just our due diligence on that firm and really, really, truly includes if there's a family, if it's the, that culture, like my quarterback, Duffy says, it's, it's huge because you want to maintain that. So the people are, the people are what make it. So what are the, some of the things you do to mitigate that risk? Usually kidnap their children. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I have a huge basement. Right, <laughs> you know that reminds me. I got I got to return one of the children to one of the guys. <laughs> right. They get to a point where they're expensive, even with bread and water. It's yeah, like yeah, no, eventually it gets catches up to you. You know, the, I, I don't know what that is. Um, just maintaining, like you know, when when my quarterback Duffy was talking about how like the the ringing of the bell. Mm. I think a company that purchases a small company like that should actually look into doing that. Mm. For the whole company. Yeah. Because nothing feels better than being a small company that goes to a bigger company. And you see the bigger companies wanting to utilize some of your ideas. Yeah. That's a good point. And I mean, what does it hurt DEA to start ringing a bell? You right. know what I'm saying? True, you know, that type right? of stuff. Or, or our Dora. Yeah, but but mm-hmm. let, let's be honest, Duffy. You did rip that door off the off the wall <laughs> after year two of like, nope, sorry. <laughs> I no hear more. that bell. <laughs> you know, an angel, one more time. <laughs> an angel got wings. Yeah, we only get a bell for million dollar contracts at DEA. <laughs> but that's how you keep your people. Yeah, you know, yeah. we we did a thing like cereal day. Like we still do it. Yeah, and you know we're starting to see other our other sisters or whatever they're like oh i like that idea let's yeah. do that or yeah, cool. we do 25 five dollar gift cards for <laughs> thanksgiving because we used to d- give everybody a turkey <laughs> but then when we get to 85 people you that's don't a lot like of turkeys, turkeys <laughs> right? so we say, oh let's just get a gift card <laughs> and now we're starting to see it being done more yeah. you know little things like that just mm-hmm. kind of make you proud of what you created in your culture yeah. and i think the larger firms need to see that and they need to adopt that not yeah. push theirs, but to adopt. You got any examples like that, Duffy? Um, I was trying to think because I know there's a handful that we've adopted that actually have integrated. So we probably got just as many positives and negatives in- integrating. I can't think of exact, you know, one specifically, but I know that there are things that integrated. Now they just become second nature. I mean, after seven, eight years, they're just part of our everyday. Yeah, uh, we are kind of running long, but I do want to ask something that's not on our list that I know it's uh, it, it, that it, that's near to your heart, Kent. Is uh, can we talk a little bit about safety culture and have you experienced? It? How do you integrate a safety focused company with someone that may not be as focused? And have you had any challenges there? And Byron, you you perked up, so I'll let you go first. <laughs> Well, ours has been the opposite way. Being a small company, we probably didn't focus on safety enough, um, which makes us adjust like our guys aren't used to. Now they have weekly safety meetings yeah. that you have to kind of expect, hey, there's going to be some non-charge time because they have to. Right. Attend. It's yeah. required that you're in this weekly meeting and stuff. Um, plus, like I assume you guys have the same thing with larger companies. We have to take like certain safety online classes and go through that. Yeah. Um it's been pretty easy. It's just obviously now it's like, okay, we actually have to make sure we're allocating time toward where we didn't. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Yep. And ditto. Absolutely the same thing. So just mm-hmm. we, we were able to um, expand our horizons on safety. And I'm just going to say, watching some of the stuff that we have to, you know, learn, I'm like, damn, I didn't know that. Yeah. You know, wow. Yeah. I wish I'd have known that 20 years ago. You know, like, right. how come this video is coming out now? Like, this is, this is crazy. Cool. They, they serve cheese on cheeseburgers. Yeah. <laughs> what? I'm not supposed to text while I'm driving. No. <laughs> oh man. It's good stuff. Uh, what else? What else? Is there something, anything we haven't talked about yet that you guys want to make sure we get out there? 
Duffy, what do you got? I can chime in on the safety part. Um, from my perspective, I mean, DA's got a fairly high or low EMR rating. Um, and so we're very safety conscious. And when you hire somebody in that's from a smaller company, it, they can no longer run in the railroad. <laughs> it turns out yeah. that that's frowned upon, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> like, and then you find out it's happened. It's like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't be doing that. All right. And I did realize I had to actually say that in orientation of, no, we can't actually do that. <laughs> like, I actually have to write that down. Like, you know, right, right in the back of the survey truck. No. no yeah, exactly. The, yeah, right. Right. Yeah, to be, yeah. With the gate down. <laughs> yeah, with the gate down. <laughs> yes. I, I want to give a one little piece of advice that I've been Love it. telling people, um, especially when it comes to this. Like on the leadership side, if things are bothering you with the uh, acquisition and the people you're working with now are for, you know, keep it to yourself. Don't take it outside and don't Mm. give it out. You know, don't, don't air your dirty laundry and stuff. And Mm. the other thing is, is if you're having a really bad day, keep it to yourself because you're the employees that work for you. They don't need to see that. They need to see Mm. that you're, you're happy because if you're happy, they're happy. And I see with, you know, mm-hmm. with some of the firms that we've acquired, you'll have the old owner or principal and just being a cancer. And that's not helpful to the employees. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, my only advice is if you're thinking about selling and it still doesn't go very well, don't don't air it. Just mm-hmm. yeah. be happy. Great advice mm. for sure. Is there a difference between a merger and an acquisition? Are they one and the same? Are they two different things? Well, it depends how you look at it. Well, it did like type of what type of transaction, obviously, right? Mm-hmm. Well, an acquisition, I would think, is is um, Byram saying, "Hey, here's hundred bucks. I'll take your company." A merger is Byram going, "Yeah, you know, here's fifty bucks for now. We're gonna <laughs> figure out how to put us together, and over time, you're gonna in, not only get that fifty bucks back, but another fifty, and maybe another fifty, and we're gonna be a team." So I, that's what I think yeah. mergers yeah, and yeah. acquisition is. I'm, 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 I'm not really good with English grammar. We really talked about that earlier. I didn't take those classes in <laughs> right, yeah. college. <laughs> what do you think, Duffy? Is there a difference? Or is, how would you describe the two? I, I have to go with what Sean said. It depends on the deal. When I look at it, um, usually when, when I think of acquiring, you're, you're, you know, you're coming a part of the other company part of their leadership, a part of their program, when you're merging, you're almost staying the same, right? And you've got some kind of deal worked out where you've got a profit share of some kind, or there's some kind Mm -hmm. of integration where you're both working together and they're separate, I guess. That's Mm -hmm. how I think about it. Yeah. And that's early on in the acquisition stages. Cause like you were saying, you know, for a while, maybe it's changed now, but it was like Hess Roundtree, a Bowman company. Correct. Right. And then eventually it will be Bowman at some point, I'm assuming. That, that's correct. We're we're still in that stage. I think they're talking about, they haven't decided exactly. I think January, like ours is a little different when it comes to that because since we were in schools mm-hmm. and our name, probably in Arizona, we're probably the number one firm yeah. for schools. That is a balancing act. You don't want to lose, you, you want to make sure that brand equity is transferred before mm-hmm. you just totally get rid of the name. Yeah. Brand equity. I like that. Just because awesome. I'm going through exactly that. I'm going through a, what we're calling a brand facelift and uh <laughs> you still have a website that's not bowman yeah. but you know i'm sure there's a transition plan and is there a playbook for this trend that i can buy that says okay after six months you're this website and then you change your email after this time and what's the, what's the playbook then is that some magic formula that no one knows no it's going to depend on the company and like i said there's a lot of factors like for us our name had a big presence in our industry. Mm. Some, if you're like, a, hey, I do some commercial stuff and I can just let my, I work with these architects, I let mm-hmm. them know. You might, it might be able to happen very quick. For yeah. ours, we get calls from clients that we haven't worked with in like 10 years because someone recommended. Oh, so they just say the name. Correct. Yeah, okay. so, it's, it's, so we've been doing a lot like sponsorships for golf tournaments and stuff, trying to get the Hess name and the yeah, yeah. name to go together so that brand equity does transfer. Mm. What, what about you, Carl? How did... did did the RPA name just disappear? 
Well, I mean, you didn't lose the shirt, I see, but you know, a shirt's a shirt compared to. <laughs> you know how much money I paid for this? Yeah, right. <laughs> I know you got a closet full. You're not just yeah. going to throw it away. Right. Uh, you know, that was something that you talked about earlier about things you have to give up. That. Ah, that's a good point. That was very hard. Mm. So not only did our Dura buy Ritok Powell, but we also bought Shepard Westnitzer and Woodson mm. Engineering to yeah. really, you know, they dominated the Northern Arizona. And I mean, they started those companies and it was really tough for people in Northern Arizona to go buy our Dura versus SWI or Woodson. Mm. Um, we we're not being very successful with our proposals because we were, we changed it to our Dora. And then what we did, because we, we get debriefed and people go like, we don't even know who Adra is, you know, or, <laughs> or, 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 you know, you're like, Oh, yeah. I get you. So now, even though I'm not supposed to, um, I'll say, you know, our Dura, you know, formerly known as Ritok Powell and Associates mm. or Shepard Westenser or Woodson, Woodson right. because, we're still a name in Arizona that people right. remember. Yeah. And then we started winning work again. I was like, Oh, Oh, you guys are those people. Okay. Right. Because the name recognition, the branding is very huge still. Yeah. Especially in this area. Yeah. Because Arizona is not that big. We all know each other. Mm -hmm. uh, Nevada is even worse. And New Mexico is even worse than Nevada. I mean, right. you're literally a handful of PLSs, PEs, you know, inspectors. So, and they all know each other. Yeah. But the government agencies that are selecting people, they mm -hmm. don't know that, you know, they're, they're not, not all of them know it. There's a big majority that don't, they're not hanging out with all of us and stuff like that. So sure. they're saying, don't repaint the truck, just peel the sticker off, <laughs> let the little, let, let it kind of be in the background and put the new sticker beside right. it. And you're like, oh, that's just the new truck. And you, know, you can still <laughs> clean, clearly see it's what's an engineering yeah. on there. Yeah. It's just a new little hard air attack. Or, or just it. wear your old shirt everywhere. Or you just yeah. wear your old shirt everywhere. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. Um, you got anything else, buddy? No, no. I've talked enough. All good? Yeah. This is the most you've talked in a long time. I know. I try to, I try every once Took in a while. pressure off me. I appreciate every that. Every once in a while, I try to have, create some input and value, value to the show. Yeah. Other value. than there just moving, moving buttons over here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks, Duffy, for joining us. Really appreciate your time. Carl, as always. Byram, you guys were awesome. Um, uh, real quick, what, what show was, uh, was Carl 15. on? 15. Carl's on 15. What yes. about Byram? 101. I wow, think. that was many yeah. years ago. Oh, so Duffy's the virgin? Yeah. Yep. Sacrificial. First timer. Sacrificial. First, first timer timer. quarterback, right? <laughs> <laughs> Duffy Hacker. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It sounds like a, a musician's name, too. <laughs> Do you have the best name? Like my name sucks compared to your name. It's like awesome. <laughs> That's why I took the job. As soon as I saw the name, like I got to work with this guy. I know. I'm going to ask my wife to start calling me Duffy. <laughs> <laughs> oh Only a night though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh uh, send, send her a link to the live stream. And she can see what he looked like. Check out this guy. <laughs> Look at his name. <laughs> right. And then if my wife actually starts to chew on her finger a little bit and go, okay, okay. I'll call you Duffy. <laughs> hey. Um, Hey, a win's a win, buddy. Take it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> oh, man. Awesome, awesome show. Really enjoyed the conversation. Absolutely. Adding value and making friends. No doubt about that. If you want to be a guest on a future show, shoot us an email at info at thegeoholics.com. Falling in reverse. Not, That's the band. With Jelly Roll. Yes. All my life. Thank you. Available everywhere. Uh, until next time, everyone. A couple takeaways I made note of. Don't be afraid to fail. If you're considering uh, an m and be prepared for God's sakes. Uh, don't air your dirty laundry. Mm. Really good advice. And most importantly, as always, be safe and healthy. Right on. Mm. So good. I've seen the video. Yeah.